and good morning. I am excited today to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Robert Gralla, Certified Public Accountant. We are lucky that he was willing to take a little time out of his busy schedule, as we all know it's tax season right now, and yep. getting any time from an accountant during this time of year, we are very grateful. So to come on in and talk to us about uh, business entities and taxation, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Mr. Robert Gralla. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a privilege to speak here this morning and for the opportunity to enlighten you and give you some information on business entities, starting up a business and taxation facts about uh, different types of business entities. Just a little quick background about me, if you don't mind. Um, I'm a certified public accountant. Everybody knows what that is. I'm also a certified fraud examiner. I help businesses uh, and attorneys find fraud in business. And I'm also a forensic accountant, which basically is sort of like a financial detective. We go in after the fact and we find out who did it, how they did it, what they did, how much they took, why they did it, and things such as that. I have a small accounting practice up in the Frisco, Texas area. Right now, I do a lot of income tax work, individual taxes, business taxes, help uh, small businesses start up and actually pick the right entity for them at the time. You know, picking a business entity is something that's very specific to a specific business, an individual. It's not a special cookie cutter that you just can go, everybody fits into the same mold. That's not how a business entity works. Really is very specific to for the type of person you are, the type of tax structure you are, what other businesses you're affiliated with and um, the business itself and how that business operates. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through a couple of different business entities and some of the uh, aspects of it and some of the taxation aspects of it as well. So if I can get my technology right, I'm gonna do a screen share so just bear with me as we get this screen share going, okay? Let's see. Um, of course, you know, we practice to do this all the time. And then when the time comes to actually do it, it's not, it's not working well, but let's see what we can do. Um, I'm looking for my PowerPoint presentation and I know it's here somewhere and I just gotta make sure that I can just put it up and do my screen share. There we go. Just bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, of course, you know, when you're trying to do it at home and no one's looking, everything works perfect. And then when you're trying to do it in public, it doesn't work here. We go. Excellent. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is who I am. That's a picture of me 35, 40 years ago when I actually uh, looked younger. Okay. Let's talk about what is a business entity. Okay, a business entity is an organization that's formed to conduct business. It's as simple as that. The type of entity determines how a business is taxed and its exposure to liability. And we're going to go through the different various types of business entities. But OK, one of the phone calls I get all the time is, Robert, I started a business. What do I do next? Well, it's question one to come into my office and let's talk about let's talk about the business. Let's talk about the type of liability exposure you're looking for. Let's talk about the kind of taxation that you need to have to save as much as you can in taxes with this new entity. So you start a business. All of a sudden, you need to have an entity formation. So let's talk about those now basically three types of entities. Of course, they're divided into more categories, but let's just talk about the basic types. You have a sole proprietorship, which we'll talk about, a partnership, and a corporation. Okay, first, let's talk about, let's take a step back a moment. Besides those three types of entities, you can also form what they call a nonprofit entity. It's a business that's been granted tax exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service because it furthers a social cause or provides a public benefit. Similar to the chamber, it provides a, a social cause. You're getting members of the same type of um, organi a business organization together, all veterans, and you're forming uh, an organization to help serve one another. Um, and also you have to form it through the state as well. The IRS gives you tax exempt status, but you also have to form it through the state as a, either a corporation or as a sole proprietorship through the state. So a nonprofit entity is something that's recognized for the federal, federal purposes as a tax exempt entity. Okay, it doesn't earn any profits. The profits that it has, it's made to be used for the purpose of the organization to give back to the members or to further its social programs. Okay, now let's talk more about business entities. Okay, the type of entity you pick is gonna determine the type of tax return you're gonna file for that entity. 
In addition, your entity will affect your personal liability as well. Certain entities, such as a sole proprietorship or a general partnership, you have no liability protection. Okay, where you have a corporation or an LLC, you have more liability protection. Let's talk a little bit about sole proprietorship. Sole proprietorships are basically the default. You start a business, you're, a, you're an entrepreneur, you're selling a product, you're doing a consulting service, you automatically become a sole proprietorship. It's the easiest thing that you need that you can do possibly, and it's a, it's a default. You file what's known as Schedule C on your personal tax return, and you take distributions. You don't take payroll or salary as a sole proprietor. You take distributions. Now, tax purposes for a sole proprietorship, you pay income tax on the net profit of this sole proprietorship, and you also pay self-employment tax. And Uncle Sam always wants to get their share of Social Security and Medicare. And it's a cat and mouse game with Uncle Sam. They're trying to get as much as you can, and we're trying to pay as little as possible. Of course, legally, as little as possible. Let's talk for a moment about self-employment tax, because it's very important. A lot of times I'll have a new client that comes in to have a sole proprietorship and they make $25,000 of net profit. And then I give them their tax return and they owe a lot of money in tax. And they go, why do I owe all this money? Well, guess what? You just got hit with self-employment tax. What it basically is, is the employer and the employee portion of social security and Medicare. When you get a payroll check from a company, have you ever noticed they take out social security and Medicare? Well, the employer, your boss also has to pay Social Security and Medicare. So when you're self-employed, guess what? You're your own boss. And Uncle Sam says, we want both portions of that Social Security. So here you're paying 15.3% of your net income, plus you're paying income tax on that as well. If you're in a 10% tax bracket, you're looking at about 25% of your net income for tax purposes, just for the federal tax, per federal tax return. So there are ways to, to lower that or limit that. And we're gonna talk a little bit further about different entities that can help limit your self-employment tax exposure. There's something called a partnership as an entity. Partnership is basically, as it says, an arrangement between two or more people and or entities. So obviously the business operations and sharing its profits and liabilities. You have a general partnership, which basically everybody in the partnership, and you can have individuals and a, a partnership is like a, a mixed bag, a, a vegetable soup of entities, you might say. You can have another partner as a partnership in a partnership. You can have a limited liability company as a partnership. You can have a corporation. Just about anybody and everybody, except for like a nonprofit, can be a partner. Trust estates can also be partners in a, in a partnership. And the difference between a general and a limited partnership is a general partnership, everybody there has liability. So let's say, you know, you have a, you're a general partner in a partnership, somebody slips and falls on your premises, or somebody in one of your partners does something illegal and you're gonna get sued, everybody in that partnership has liability. The net income from a partnership, you're taxed through what they, we'll show you in a slide, a little bit of a few minutes called the K-1 form, you're taxed at the, the income. A partnership does not pay tax, it's a flow to entity. And what that means is the partners pick up their portion of their ownership and of their ownership percentage of the entity and they pay tax on that percentage of the profit of the partnership. A limited partner or a limited partnership is a little bit different. You have limited liability. Now with a limited partnership, you have two types of partners. You have a general partner and a limited partner. And you always have to have a general partner because you have to have some liability in there. However, what a lot of people do to work around that is uh, you can have an LLC as a general partner, which is a limited liability company, or have another limited partner as a general partner. And even though the limited partnership has a general partner for liability, that liability is taken down almost, almost, almost no liability if it's another limited type of liability company. I know this may sound confusing, but when you actually sit down and do a flow chart, it's amazing how this can work out and limit your liability. And once again, the taxation from partners, when you're a partner, you get your percentage of ownership you have to share that amount of income on your personal tax return. As I said, partnerships file on form 1065. They take distributions and or guaranteed payments. Of distribution is basically, you know, you, you're, you're showing profit of $50,000. So you and somebody else own 50% of that entity. So you take 25,000, the other person takes 25,000. You don't take salary as a partner in a partnership. 
Oh, let's talk about corporations. A corporation is an independent legal entity that separates your personal assets and liabilities from your business assets and liabilities. Basically, a corporation is its own legal entity. It has its own liability. It has its own assets. It has its own income and it has its own losses. And it basically is its own entity legally. It's set up through the state and you file on the uh, tax return on the federal level. For the state of Texas, you have to file franchise tax returns. And usually if your revenue is less than 1.1 million, there's no taxation on your, on your uh, corporation. Corporation has to have shareholders, a board of directors and officers. It has, an, it has a, a, a lifetime, it has a, a very long lifetime of corporation. It's two ta basic types of corporations. There's something called the C-Corp and an S-Corp. And the reason they call it a C or an S because that's the subchapter of the federal tax code that, that it comes under, subchapter C or subchapter S. But there are two big differences in, in corporations, S corps and C corps. For a C corp, it's its own entity. It pays tax on the net income. And the downfall of a C corporation is double taxation. You pay tax twice. What that basically means is this. At the end of the day, the end of your fiscal year, you have $10,000 of profit in your, in your C corporation. That's after you figure out your income, less your expenses. And as an officer <clears throat> or an owner, you can take your salary as well, which is one way to get money out of a corporation. So you have this $10,000 that's left at the end of the year, and you're going to pay income tax on that at whatever the income tax rate is for corporations. It's about 20%. And then what happens is you want to get the rest of that money out of the corporation. You have to take what's known as a dividend. And guess what? The corporation paid tax on that $10,000 of net profit. When you take that out in the form of a dividend, you're going to pay personal tax on that. So a C-Corp, the downfall is that you have to pay double taxation. One of, the, one of the pros, though, is that the corporation pays its tax, and you as an officer or a shareholder don't pay personal tax on it. Now, you have a hybrid called an S-Corporation, which is basically a combination between a partnership, a flow-through entity, and a corporation. It files on a, on a form called an 1120S. As a shareholder or an officer, you're required to take compensation. Um, and you also have at the end of the day, let's say your corporation has $25,000 of net profit. Well, guess what? Besides taking salary, instead of the corporation paying tax on that, the corporation pays no tax. That flows through to the owners, the shareholders. So you have an S corporation. You took salary of $50,000 through the year. You're gonna pay tax on that 50,000. And then you have a $25,000 profit at the end. Well, the shareholders are going to pay tax on that $25,000 profit personally. One of the reasons that it's good is because if you're in a lower tax bracket, there's a lot less tax to be paid on that distribution than if you did it on, on a corporate level. And at the end of the year, you get what's called an 1120SK1 form to show your portion of the profits, the losses, and, and other, other factors that might uh, come into play for your personal tax return. So basically two types of corporations, you have a C Corp, which is taxed on its own profits, and you have an S Corp, which the shareholders pay the tax on its profits. And one of the other benefits of, as you know, of corporations is the shareholders and, and the owners have limited liability. The corporation takes on the liability for a corporation, not you personally. Now, I love talking about LLCs. LLCs basically are a piece of clay. It's a legal entity for state purposes, state purposes only. You have um, a single member LLC and then you have multi-member LLCs. Now, for the state, you go to the state, you go, I want to form a limited liability company, and you form this company, then you have to say to yourself, how do I want to be taxed for federal tax purposes? Well, let's backtrack to all those different things. It could be a sole proprietorship where you just own the LLC, and you file this on your Schedule C, and you pay your self-employment tax and income tax. If there's more than two members, more than one member, rather, two or more members of an LLC, as long as they're not husband and wife, it's automatically a partnership, or you can say, um, Uncle Sam, you know, federal government, I'd like to be taxed as a corporation, a C Corp or an S Corp. I love working with LLCs because it gives you a lot of flexibility. You form the LLC on the state level, and then you can go to the federal government. I want to be taxed as this, that, or the other thing. Whereas if you form a partnership or if you form a C Corp or an S Corp, 
you have to be taxed at, on that level for the federal government. With an LLC, you can determine, you can request to be taxed any way you like uh, with the federal government. Even a, a single member LLC, you can say to the federal government, please tax me as a C Corp or an S Corp. A lot of flexibility. And a lot of people that are starting a new business, I always recommend that they do it as an LLC. Uh, let me see on my notes if there's more I want to talk about with an LLC. Now, once again, um, don't forget, you know, as a single member LLC, you have that self-employment tax. One of the ways to eliminate that is if you do form a corporation, you can eliminate a good portion of that self-employment tax. Um, I think basically this is the conversation I wanted to have. This is my, my presentation about um, entities, startup entities, business entities. Now, a lot of times a business starts up and five or 10 years or three years later, their business changes, the structure of their business changes, their income, their ownership changes on, on that business. Every couple of years, you really need to look at what type of structure you have and determine, is this the right structure that we have going forward? Should we make a change? Should we not make a change? I can help. A lot of times when I deal with my clients, I always look at their structure. I, I have a conversation with them. Tell me what you're doing now. Tell me what you plan to do in the future. And we talk about their, their income. We talk about how they're being taxed on their income. And we talk about going forward. Also, each of these entities has various types of investment vehicles for, and vehicles for uh, retirement. An LLC might have a, a single proprietorship, might have a different type of, of uh, structure for a, a pension plan or an IRA, as opposed to an S Corp or a C Corp or a partnership. Okay, um, Chris is great with that. I would recommend have a conversation with him, which is the, which is the best way to start a retirement plan for your, for your entity. But each entity has specific rules for what they can do and, and what they can't do. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, I've gone through the basic um, types of structures for a business. When you're starting up, what's the best structure? As I said, it's not really something that's a cookie cutter. You need to really look at what you're doing, what you're offering in terms of your products, your services, and what you want for your liability to determine the best structure that you can have for yourself and for your business. I want to thank you. I'm looking at my time. It's almost 15 minutes into the into this presentation. I would love to leave a few minutes open for any um, conversation or any questions that anybody has. And once again, I want to thank you and thank the chamber and thank Christine for, and, and Irving for the opportunity and Christy for the opportunity to present and speak with everybody this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grala. We appreciate You're you welcome. taking time out of your busy tax season to come in and give us an overview of different entities and some of the tax implications of that. Does anybody have any quick questions for him? I know yeah, I, I do. So Ro Robert, that, that is one of the clearest explanations I've ever heard of a very confusing topic. So fantastic job on that. So when you say if you have a LLC and you can decide to tax it anyway. Ultimately, if you're an LLC and you decide you want to be taxed as an S Corp, you do have to go back and create that S Corp, correct? No. Oh, really? No. What you do is this, you file your limited liability paperwork with the state. And I've seen my clients do this all the time. So now the state says, Irving, congratulations, Fran Choice is a new LLC. Then you go, great, let me speak to Rob because I want to be taxed as an S Corp. Okay, four numbers you need to know. 2553, okay? Form 2553, you file that with the Internal Revenue Service, they give you the approval, guess what? You're now taxed as an S corporation for federal tax purposes. Wow. Simple as that. Okay, you can file corporate, see what happens is you can file corporate paperwork with the state and now you're a corporation. Then you still have to file with the Internal Revenue Service that 2553 and request to be taxed as, a, as an S corp. A C corporation is the default. Okay, so if you're a C corp, for, if you're a corporation for state purposes, the IRS will recognize you as a C corp. If you want to be an S corp, you have to file that paperwork, and they approve that. Then you're an S corporation. That's simple. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You, you see, you know what I always say? I'm on the, even on the back of my business card, it says that if you think the cost of a professional is expensive, hire an amateur. And the information <laughs> that I present to people all the time, they go like. Wow, that's so easy. I explained what, what you have to do. And if you break it down to simple terms, it's very easy. And that's why we're, we're professionals because we know what we're doing, our experience and our skills and our education. Robert, this is John from Houston. I've got a quick question for you. So I've got a LLC now. I actually have two of them. And okay. one of them where my business partner and I are transitioning into an S Corp. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the, 
it, it's going to kind of will it will the IRS retroactively back to the first of January or is there a you know a certain time that I'm existing as LLC and, and responsible for that and then as of a certain date I'm now responsible as an S corp or is it okay that that's up to you and, I, and I'll tell you why usually what happens when you file as an S corp you can have your usually you file it for the full year so and it kind of also depends because. There's a lot of different ways you file for the S Corp. Usually you're supposed to do it. You have two and a half months to file your S Corp status for the prior year, or you can go forward and file it in the future. Let's say for now you want to file for 2022. And usually the S Corp starts as of January 1st of the year that you're filing the S Corp election for. So let's say you go back and you want to file it now for 2020. You can do what they call a late filing election. The regular filing is over, but you can do a late filing. You go back and go IRS. I want to make this late filing as of January 1st, 2020. IRS approves it. You're an S Corp as of 2000 and January 1st, 2020. So you don't have to split years between LLC and S Corporation income and, and, and profits. Make sense? That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, hey, while I'm on a roll, anyone else? <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just kind of curious by a show of hands. Okay. I have all the tax return so far. <laughs> I have a question. I'm sorry, sir. You had a question. Yes. Uh, so from an LLC, um, if you loan money to a third party, how much can be forgiven as far as, uh, as bad debt? If you write it off as bad debt, <laughs> it depends how much money that they don't give you back. Okay. And can it, can it carry forward, uh, several years? Well, you, you see, now you're talking about it. It's, it's that's a different topic of bad debt expense. Okay. Now, uh, what now you're an LLC. Once again, what, uh, what is your federal entity level? Well, I do two returns. I do the, I do the LLC with schedule C, which flows through. Okay. Okay. And then I do the personal return. Okay. As so what happens is this, what happens is this, you have a, a business bad debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. You, is this money that you lent out through your business? No, lend it to a third party. Okay. Who lent the money? You or the your business, business, the business. Okay. So what happens is this, you have a legitimate debt. I assume you have a, a loan agreement or a note agreement with this third party. Correct? Yes. Okay. So the per, as soon as that, that note or that loan becomes uncollectible, you, you can write that off as a bad debt. Now, please understand, this is not tax advice. This is just a general discussion. Okay. I'm not giving you tax advice. This is just a discussion. I would have to look more into detail to, to get to, to, to understand a little bit more. But basically, if it's a bad debt, you can write that off. And that would be a person that would go on your... Your net, your net loss on your, your C, on your Schedule C. Right. Okay. Now, you can also have, um, if it's more than your net income of all of your other sources on your personal return, you can have what they call a net operating loss. You can carry okay. it back or you can ca to, to wipe out income in prior years and get a refund, or you can carry that forward for okay. future years and, and write that off against future income. Yeah, that's how it had been. I didn't know if there's been any changes. That's why I ask. Yeah, no, nothing like with a net, uh, net operating loss has changed. It's all okay. The same. All right, thank the you. You know that it has changed though under the CARES Act is the amount of amount of years you can write, you can go carry it back. And usually with the CARES Act now, it's back five years, which I believe is the 2015. Okay, great. Okay. Robert, thank you. does he have to show any sort of documentation where he attempted to collect the debt, or is it just word well, of mouth? Yeah, that's a very good question. Like for example, I'm working with a client right now that has about a fifty thousand dollar bad debt because the person who owes them the money went into bankruptcy and we have all the bankruptcy papers from court. IRS can't deny that. If you don't have anything to prove that it's a bad debt, and if you ever got audited, the IRS would want some sort of documentation, some sort of proof that, you, that the debt is bad. You know, can you show that you reasonably tried to collect it? You have to show how, what did you do? Did you go to a debt collection agency? Did you go there with a, a couple of people with, with baseball bats and try to collect it that way? You know, <laughs> it, it all depends on what documentation and what you've done, what reasonable steps you've taken to collect that debt and prove that it's a bad debt. I have a question um, and great presentation, some phenomenal information there. Is it a is it mandatory for a professional such as a, a doctor or a dentist, um, licensed um, therapist, to have a PLLC, or can they operate under an L, uh, just a traditional LLC? Very good question. An attorney uh, or an accountant or professional, and I don't have the fullest of professionals. Actually, if you call the Secretary of State in, in Texas, I don't have the number of fan. I actually have it dialed into my phone automatic. Um, they can tell you, but yes. An attorney, 
um, an accountant, and I believe doctors, don't quote me on that, have to file a PLLC if they want to have an LLC in Texas. And basically the difference between an LLC and a PLLC is a PLLC is a professional limited liability company. And for whatever reason, the state wants that designation. And sometimes the uh, authority that licenses you in the state want that. For example, uh, the state accounting board requires us to be a PLLC if we're an LLC. Same thing with the state, um, the state bar. Um, you can get a list from the secretary of state and you can call them, they usually answer their phones and they can tell you whether your entity or not has to be a PLLC if you decide to file as an LLC. Does that oh. help? But yes, absolutely, thank you. And and sure. one other question is the last one, I promise. So if you are an LLC, are you required to, um, and you are, you have an escort designation, are you required to issue yourself a W-2 as an employee or can you still use pass-through income to your, um, uh -huh. was it the I, ones? I have a feeling we had this conversation once before. I'm having some deja vu for some reason, but let me answer that, let me answer that question. As a shareholder, a working shareholder of an S corporation, the IRS requires you to have what they call reasonable compensation, which is a whole other definition. As such, you're required to issue yourself a W-2 form from an S corporation. The only time you don't take a payroll or a salary as an owner would be if you're a sole proprietorship or a partner, if you're the, one of the owners of the, of the entity. If you're a partnership and you have employees, you're required to give them W-2 forms. But as a partner, you're not required to take salary. As an owner of a, of a sole proprietorship, you're not required to take salary. As an owner of an S Corp, you, prob you probably are required to take a reasonable salary and then you issue yourself a W-2 form. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Robert, Paul, it's Henry, Patrick's Henry. hand was up also. So Paul, then Patrick, and then we're going to wrap it up because I have right. a feeling, Robert, we time. have a ton of questions for you. Okay, which who's next? Paul, I saw your hand up for a moment. And then Patrick? Did you say Paul? Yeah, yes, Paul. I did. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, so Robert, great seeing you. Um, as you know, um, I run a nonprofit organization with 100% volunteers. Um, there are personal expenses that uh, our volunteers uh, um, encounter, uh, you know, periodically. I, uh, and I, I know we've had this discussion, but is there a person that you can recommend that can talk to us about uh, nonprofit organizations and taxation? Um, specifically, what is it that you're looking for for that? Well, um, obviously, if someone donates something, that's a, a tax. Uh, uh, a donation, tax, tax write-off donation potential. Uh -huh. uh, uh, personal travel, uh, you know, if I send somebody out to Timbuktu, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of uh, activity. Real quick, and then I'll, I'll give you some advice. Um, if you're doing work for a nonprofit, usually you can't donate your services. In other words, like I'm a CPA and I do a tax return for a nonprofit. I can't write off as a charitable contribution the cost of my service. However, I can write off what they call out-of-pocket expenses. In other words, the mileage to my office, to your place to pick up your accounting records to do the return or, or, or the, the folders of the files or the paper, whatever it actually costs me in hard dollars, real money, I can write off as an expense. I can't write off the cost of my service. So you have volunteers, they can write off the mileage as a charitable contribution that goes under their charitable contributions on Schedule A as an itemized deduction if they itemize. If you'd like, Paul, after tax season, I could put together maybe a little white paper or maybe come down to your place and we can have a conversation with your volunteers and we can talk about what you can deduct for tax purposes and what you can't. So maybe after tax season, we could do something like that and if that would help you. Robert, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Bill. Okay. Well, put that I, on my calendar. I'd like to second that. Um, so if after tax season, when, it, when you have time, if you put that kind of cheat sheet for all of us to uh -huh. have because we're going to need it for the chambers. Chambers are also nonprofit, right? Uh -huh. um, and we do have volunteers. Um, so I would like to give that cheat sheet to our volunteers so that they know what they can deduct on their taxes. Great. So I'll be I would to take that as well. Thank you so much. Patrick, you're next. Uh, mine, the, is there any special stuff with COVID? My industry was hit pretty hard. We actually got some 
free money, I guess grant money from the county of Denton and PPP is a normal loan, but is there any weird circumstances that would help me out um, from being like restaurants, they got hit as well? Okay, well, that's, there's a lot of different topics you said in that, that one thing. Um, as far as money that the county gave you, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I couldn't tell you what to do. I, I don't know, to be honest with you. The PPP loans are forgivable if you qualify for forgiveness. Uh, first round was over and a lot of people are filling out their forgiveness applications. The second round is coming up right now. If you're trying to qualify, well, actually March, I believe March 9th was the last date to qualify for the second round of PPP loans. Um, there's things called, there's certain employee retention credits you could possibly have for employees. Um, and um, then there's things, there's things like that. Uh, Specific to your industry, there's more of the employee retention credit that I, that I would look for, um, for, for, uh, for tax purposes. And if you got a PPP loan, the forgiveness of the PPP loan. Okay? Very good, thanks. You're welcome. I don't Thank know, um, Christine, if you have time for more questions. I mean, I have all morning. I have no problem with that. I don't know if want to <laughs> We're going to wrap I'm, things up. <laughs> you have to understand, it's either I'm sitting here enjoying this session, enjoying speaking to everybody here, or have to go and do some hard work in my office. And I'd rather just sit here and drink coffee and enjoy the presentation. So if anybody has more questions, great. And if you want to wrap it up, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up, but we have Robert's contact information in the chat. So if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to him and maybe he'll get back to you in between filing taxes. Uh, thank you so much and uh, happy birthday. Your birthday's coming up soon, I heard. So happy birthday. Yes, thank you. Um, we posted in chat. There's also a spot in there where I had the link to our Facebook Facebook page and the link to our LinkedIn page. This way you can go in and thank our guest speaker because what a wealth of information that he shared with us today. So thank you so much. Um, let's wrap things up. And